Hello. I, uh... Yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> really, 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 really cold and fun. Cold and fun. That's good that you think that of it because that's what deer hunting typically is, is cold and fun. Yeah. Yesterday morning I'm glassing up on the pass and I see these deer moving and I'm like, ooh, there's deer moving. All of a sudden I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like, I'm like, is that hard? My dad always talks about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So Robert's when you're the 275 pounds, I don't know how you do that, but the Freightliner. <laughs> it's just like a creeper. You're just kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. <laughs> yeah. You know. He's like, <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping and pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> how did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. How did you say his name? Her Hervé Velasquez. <laughs> 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 Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast, brought to you by Pertnir Outdoors. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. Thanks for joining us, and I think I've got a good one for you this week. So this week's episode will be with John Legansky of Sportsman's 101 and Whitetail 101. So I think John and I ended up having a, a pretty fun conversation, and I think you'll enjoy it too. Uh, John has a pretty cool product he's put together called Whitetail 101, which is kind of a soup to nuts program to uh, get you started if you are new to hunting and new to the outdoors and uh, are looking for just kind of to get your toes wet and understand what you need to get started hunting altogether and as well as you know getting into deer hunting. Uh, this is an, an awesome little program. So definitely uh, we'll talk a little bit about that and then kind of get into some other things uh, that I think you will enjoy the discussion of. So that is that. Uh, we're going to look at some quick events we got coming up here around New York State uh, and in Western New York in particular over the next uh, few weeks and throughout the month of March. March is going to be a very busy month for us here. Uh, so we've got uh, the 5th through the 8th. So this upcoming weekend, we got the Western New York uh, travel and sport expo that's uh, at the Erie County Fairgrounds and uh, that's a really good time I will probably frequent that a couple times over the weekend and may, might be working the BHA booth a little bit and uh, and also hoping to get to interact with a few of the different uh, guides and companies that are there and I believe my a couple of my uncles are going to be up there to visit and potentially try to try to book a hunt for uh, archery elk in Colorado. So I look to interact a little bit with those guys on that and uh, see what that experience is like trying to figure out where they want to go. So we got that coming up this weekend, the 5th through the 8th. Uh, BHA will be talking about uh, their upcoming pint night, which will be the following week at on the 12th, March 12th at 6.30 p.m. They're doing a pint night at Rusty Nickel Brewing Company in West Seneca. So we hope to have a good turnout for that and uh, definitely want to think that'd be a good way to kind of get people in the area aware of the event and uh, aware of BHA and what they're up to around New York State. So definitely swing by the booth and get the little flyer for that and uh, hope to see you on the 12th at the Pint Night. Uh, the Rochester, the, the greater, I believe it's a greater Rochester QDMA chapter, uh, they have their banquet coming up on the 14th of March, so Saturday night the 14th. Uh, that looks like a pretty fun event too. Unfortunately, I will not, and I don't think any of us are going to be able to make that this year. I've never been, but maybe in the future would like to plan on it. But if you're, uh, you know, looking for one of these banquets to go to and maybe turkey hunting is not your thing, uh, but deer hunting is, I think this would be a, a great opportunity for you. And I think there's a few other QDMA branches around, uh, New York state that may be doing their events this time of year as well. And then, uh, so lastly, on the event schedule coming up, the NWTF banquets are rocking and rolling. So we've been talking about that the last month, and uh, and definitely there's a there's a pile of them happening in, in the month of March. So the one that we're all attending uh, from Pertnier Outdoors will be at the one at uh, Lima Country Club with the Crossroads Limb Hangers on the 28th of March. Definitely looking forward to that. Should be a riot, always is, and uh, hopefully we come home with some goodies this year again. And, uh, so definitely go to, go to 
nwtf.org and go to the events tab and just search events locally in your area. Uh, there is a lot of events going on uh, in the next month, month and a half. So certainly recommend it. It's a, it's a great night out. It's a good time. Uh, for 60 bucks, you can get a single ticket and, uh, and you can go and have a good time and you have some opportunities raffle wise with your $60 purchase and uh, get dinner and everything on uh, some good entertainment for the night. So it's a fun night out. Definitely recommend it for everybody. So with all that said, make sure to check out our links in our bio and uh, to get directed to some of the different stuff that we're up to. But uh, a few good episodes you know, coming down the pipe, and uh, hopefully this is one that you all enjoy as well with uh, me sitting down with John and chatting with him. So enjoy. Thanks a lot. Get outside, let the snow melt, and then start pounding that dirt. See if you can find yourself some sheds. So thanks, everybody. Keep feeding them. <laughs> We're, it's fine. We'll get it in post, as they say. It's that shitty Colorado internet you got. There's too many damn people <laughs> in that state now. That's the problem. There's a lot of people up here, man. You're one uh, of them. And it, you're one of them. I know. I'm the problem. You I'm are the problem. problem. That's I first can't. step is admitting that you're part of the problem. Yeah. Me and my damn Mexican wife stealing all the jobs. <laughs> Taking all the jibs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you know, I actually mostly drive the people around. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the, most of the people I drive around actually are like the J one students. You said you, you came up here, right? And, uh, you, you hunted white river national forest. I did a couple times. Cool. Oh, so you, you actually know this area better than I do. I might have some questions for you. I'm ready to start going and searching for, for sheds and stuff up here. Well, being the fact you've only been there for a few months, then I probably, I probably do know the area a little bit better than you do, but by far, not an expert, but have a pretty good I idea what's going on in a few areas. Oh, there you are. Oh, I see. So this is oh, okay. That's confusing. I pushed the little um, camera button, but it just opened a window and it wasn't showing you me. Here's me. I got you. Look at this that. What I look like? Ugly ass yeah. face. Uh, you know, we're we're neither one of us. We're both balding. You've say. you've fully given in. I'm. I, I'm going to. I went to buzz cut, and now I'm headed, headed down there. Yeah, road. we all we all go through the progression, unless you go with like the toupee thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's it's my humble opinion that you know our national mascot is bald. So if you're not, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> right. Look yourself. Look yourself <laughs> in the mirror. Have some pride. Right. What are you, a terrorist? <laughs> 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 It, you gotta put the uh, the screeching eagle. In the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I committed to it, man. My my mom's side of the family was all bald before thirty. So basically, you see from from here up to my eyebrows. Yeah. And then straight back to right before you reach my ass crack. That's where. Uh, that's the next time you'll find hair. Oh, that's exciting. I I didn't need to know about the back end, <laughs> but I guess we all could have put the pieces together. I'm in a sharing mode. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Um, no, actually, so um, the uh, so the, the White River thing. You you said you've been there uh, up here like multiple times. Like where did where did you did you enter in the same place every time, or like what was your? Um, we it's a big national forest, man. I mean, it, it stretches between basically all the towns that you can. Do you have to go around the mountains to get to? You right. can get into White River. Yeah, we've come in from a couple couple different angles, and I've vacationed out there. I've hunt out there. Um, you know, done some hiking in different areas, skied. So I, I feel like that area there, the White River National Forest, has kind of been my second home over the last six, eight years. I mean, that's where we go for vacation. So yeah, it's we know quite a bit about that area, and and there's a lot left to learn. You know, you think you're covering. I think that was a big thing for me when we did our first trip out there. Was you think you know big territory? <laughs> and then you get up one of those drainages and it's like, wow, I am completely meaningless in this universe. Like that looking was like down into it. Yeah. Well, looking down like, in or from gosh. the bottom, looking up, you're like Judas priest, you know, I, that was, mm -hmm. that was one of the first things that hit my mind on our first, uh, hunting trip out there. Our first backpacking trip. I'd never been backpacking ever. And so my first experience was going back in to, uh, into the gore range and Lord have mercy. Was that like a, a soul a soul finding experience when you realize how like literally i guess the best way to say it is like how unimportant you are once you disappear into that wilderness like there's 
like something could happen to you and the world just keeps turning, you know, where we're... it just keeps right on going. Yeah. yeah. Nobody gives a damn. And and then it makes you, and then you go home that fall and you try to hunt that big buck. On he, 40 he, acres. He, he, yeah. And he, and he busts you. And, and you, I actually, I had that, that moment actually, and we can cover this later. Um, Cause you said you're going to ask about some hunting stories, but the one, the, the most memorable moment this year was actually a grand failure. I got totally busted by like definitely definitely the largest buck living on that property 10 point like easily 150 class buck um probably would have been the biggest buck of my life and he looked and he kind of like looked into the blind and he was like what i feel like i see yeah i'm out and he kind of just like <laughs> he kind of half flagged and he's like nah i don't like it i don't know whether he would have come within range if i'd had a gun at 63 yards right. that deer would be on my wall right now but uh, you know i was bow hunting and I, I don't do a lot of hunting from blinds anyways the reason i brought that up is because i went back after that i mean i was beating myself up for like three days like what else could i do man i just i let a little bit too much light into the blind i think and yeah he was just able to make out the silhouette there was uh, in that situation i just probably never had a chance but i realized like well i still got venison this year uh my money still went in the pot like again the world keeps turning and like i did my part i got it my my disappointment was purely ego fed. Right. Like I wanted the big antlers and that was it. But actually like the biggest deer of my life that I ever got, the backstrap was really hard to cook. Yeah. You know, like it's uh, you gotta like, you almost have to age it or like, you really gotta know what you're doing with those bigger old wily animals, man. They just, they've been around the block so long, got all, got all that folic acid built up. So it's like, you know, like I was disappointed, but is it like nobody else really cares? No, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I think that's like that's a big thing that I came to the realization of over the last few years that at the end of the day, like you can shoot a huge buck, but I mean everybody's like, God damn, you shot a big buck, and then next thing you know, they've forgotten about it and they've moved on, and you moved <laughs> yeah. on, and it's like all that for what, you know? So it's like it's now, a dog eat hashtag world, man. Hashtag sure is, you know, and that's <laughs> if. And I think we're, we're, so right now we're talking and it's the middle of February. And if you've been following along with us, we've been heavy on the meat processing train the last month. And now we're just into eating, you know, it's, it's eating yeah. time. And it's actually my favorite part of hunting. If I'm it being is. Honest. So like, if you, you look at my, yeah, my, you get, my Instagram feed is like tacos and, and steaks. And <laughs> it's like, it's actually more of a food blog. Well, I got to remember to post hunting videos every once in a while. Well, and, but see, that's. I think that's the part we you forget a lot of times to talk about is that that's a huge piece of it. You know, you chase yeah. that deer from maybe October one to right before Christmas, and then your hunting season's over, and then you've got the whole rest of the year where you're hopefully enjoying the meat you harvested, and then you're starting to think about and plan for the next year. So you spend more time doing that yeah. than you do actually the hunting piece of it. You know, so why don't why don't I introduce who you are first because this is good talk, and I don't want to just okay. be. A, everybody wondering who this random dude is I'm talking to on the phone. So I am joined today by John Legansky. Did I nail it? Yeah, drilled it, man. Good old Polish boy. So I've got John on here, and I had heard of John first on the uh, Tomorrow's Hunter podcast, a couple guys out of their Mississippi, right? Yeah. So a couple southern boys boys. started a podcast, and uh, they're really, really fascinating to listen to, a couple – really well-educated guys, well-spoken. And so I had started tagging along with them. They had messaged messaged me, I believe, back when they first started their podcast. I don't really know, but somehow I connected with them. I listened to a podcast with you and was extremely intrigued about what you were getting going and getting off the ground. So I wanted to get you on here to, you know, kind of talk a little bit about what you have going on with Whitetail 101. But then as you and I, that was probably about a month ago at this point, um, you and I have talked quite a bit on the phone and kind of hit it off and have a lot in common and we've lived two completely different lives. And I think your backstory is fascinating on how you've gotten to where you are and what you're trying to do with this program. So definitely excited to, uh, to kind of just see where this conversation goes and, and, uh, continue to build our, our friendship and, you know, learn more about what you have going on in your end. So. Yeah. Thanks, Billy. Uh, thanks for having me, man. I, um, so I, yeah, it's all, you know, truth be told, I, I had not yet discovered you guys when you messaged me and then I went and I started listening to some of your podcasts. I'm like, Oh, these guys are right in line with me too. This is awesome. I actually, the very, <clears throat> excuse me, the very first episode I listened to, was like your log talk reboot. 
Yeah. Which I'm really glad I listened to that one because I'm like, what the hell is feeding him? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, sh- I, sh- I should like encourage everyone to start with that podcast. You know, if you're listening to this one and you haven't listened. Yeah, you should make it like kind of the landing page, right. you know, or the, the main link or whatever. Because um, it kind of explains some of the, you know, you got, I don't want to call them like inside jokes. They all make total sense once you've kind of like followed along. But it's kind of like jumping into, I don't know, the office or something where you're like, it's funny. But you might not get every single joke if you come into episode, you know, season four, episode twelve. So, yeah. um, but no, I've really enjoyed what you guys have been talking about, um, and we can hit on a lot of that stuff. Actually, I made like copious notes because I'm like, man, these guys are like really talking about the stuff that I want to talk about. Um, but you know, truth be told, I just the 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 reason the reason I I said yes when you asked me on the show was because within the first two episodes that I listened to, there was a common theme, uh, not just you, but you know, the other guys on your show talking about what you guys want to do and then actionable steps. You're actually taking towards doing it. Lots of people talk about this stuff. Mm-hmm. All the hunter recruitment numbers and we got to get more numbers and, you know, and everybody, it's like everybody seems to share that same article online, you know, from NPR or whatever, like every second or third month in the bull hunters of America, Facebook group. I'm like, we know, what are we doing about it? Right. And so it was, you know, this whole thing started like two years ago now where it was like, what, well, what can we do about it? Uh, you know, cause it's like, well, you know, if we, if everybody just mentored one new hunter, this thing would be solved in a year. The truth is mentoring hunter is kind of, it's kind of hard and it's really time consuming. And it, it, it first off puts a lot of pressure on you, but it also all that guarantees that you're not going to have as much success, especially if you're at a point in your hunting career where you're trying to go after more mature animals because you're doubling your scent profile. You have somebody making mistakes with you in the woods. You have somebody that isn't prepared if they didn't wash their stuff properly or whatever, you know, there's, there's just so many more elements. I mean, you know, in my experience, um, <clears throat> filming for the whitetail one one series, um, cause it's, you know, the guide isn't just me and a couple you know, family members and friends like talking at a camera. We're out there in the field kind of showing you as we're doing this stuff, like you said, all the way from like March, April, all the way through in October and November and, and through the run into the late season. Uh, so it's step-by-step guide that takes a lot of filming and I can't do it all myself. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife was a vegetarian of 14 years till she met me. Uh, and I took her to like kind of a, like how to hunt deer, um, workshop that the state of Illinois DNR was putting on. And most states have those now. I think Illinois was one of the last ones to uh, introduce them. But she, she kind of picked up some, some stuff uh, and she was asking me a bunch of questions in the car. And I was like, great. So, and she was like excited to go out, you know, she's like, I'm not exactly thrilled to watch you kill something, but the experience actually sounds really, really exciting. And that's, I totally agree. I actually, you know, I don't love killing animals, but it's a part of what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I try to do it as well as I can. I actually love just being out there and experiencing that. And that's, that was part of the driving um, motivation was like, man, I feel like there's a lot of people who are yearning for a better connection to the outdoors, to their food, whatever it is. And when you start to draw those connections, you become more involved in the whole model. And, and then, you know, guys like you and me, it, there's, there's probably a hundred or more, channels out there having conversations like this, these people are going to find those for themselves and they're going to start to learn more and figure out like, Oh, we're, we're losing these lands We're you know, our species are doing kind of poorly. You know, there's these, there's these protections in place and they're very much, they're always on the chopping block, you know? So to involve more people in, in these conversations that they've more or less, you know, kind of by an extension of politics in general, a lot of people, I feel like just kind of tune out. It's like, well, can't really control much. It'll take care of itself type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it does not. There are, there are an increasingly limited number of people fighting this fight harder and harder. And at a certain point, man, the, you know, like the, um, the, the breach occurs and the dam is, uh, you know, the water comes pouring over the dam, so to mm-hmm. speak. So that, that was really the driving motivation. When I started it was, well, it was, a, it was a money thing because everybody's talking about tag and licenses. And, and the money coming in from Pittman Robinson and, and the taxes and all that. And that's totally valid, but it's like one half of the equation. The other half is like, there's a lot of people out there that just aren't 
they're not engaged with any of this that's going on. There's so much available to us for free or very, very cheap that you can just go. You don't need anybody's permission. You can just go and enjoy this stuff. Like you said, I like to hike, right? My, my wife and I love to hike. Um, that's preparing me for these kind of elk and mule deer hunts, which I've never done before. Mm -hmm. If I really wanted, I mean, if I really wanted venison out here, I'd just go into the backyard because there's deer walking through town of Eagle, like every night, you know, eating the neighbor's landscaping, but I want that experience. And that, that's what I'm, if more than a program, that's kind of what I've, I've realized I'm selling is, is that experience and that connection to food, nature, or, or whatever it is you seek out there. Yeah. So I guess kind of going back to square one of like, who's John Legansky. So how, how did you're about, how old are you? You're gotta be about the same age. I am. I'm in my 32, I'm 32 as well. So we're the same age. So you were, you were born and what raised month? Uh, November 9th, middle okay. of the rut. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got to respect my elders. Yeah. No way. Well, Valentine's baby. As a matter of fact, we Wait, figured that no, out. No, a few November, years ago. 80, November 87. I'm older than you. Yeah. Yeah. Bow to me. <laughs> he really did it. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever makes you feel big and strong host, over there. Billy. Yeah. So, so you were you were asking. Um, I was asking. Yeah, you just freaking derailed me. We were bo we were both <laughs> born in November, the same age. So what? I guess like where where are you from? What's your upbringing? And like how? I you explained to me, you know, how you've kind of had you've you're into music, you're entertaining, doing stuff like that, and then like how the hell did you get around? I know you just yeah. kind of talked about Whitetail 101, but like, how the hell did you get to the point where you were putting together a program that's taking you two years to build? How did I get from A to B? Uh, so we'll do, I'll, I'll try and do a real quick timeline. I grew up like south suburbs of Chicago, uh, like 25 miles outside of the city. Um, and what I realized it was not actually like the best neighborhood growing up. It's actually kind of going downhill. Um but regardless, we, so we're, we're growing up and my dad had married into my mom's side of the family. Now, my dad always grew up in Chicago, like in the city, right by Midway Airport, if anybody's been to Chicago. So super Polish. That's where the ski comes from. <laughs> he married into my mom's family, which is from basically half uh, like Florida Panhandle, half like central southern Missouri. So very hunting centric cultures, right? They like pigs and lots of fishing turkey deer like that's what you did for like three quarters of the year and then you ate it the rest of the time and my dad didn't really <laughs> he didn't get the best reception in my mom's side of the family my dad can be a little bit much to accept but i love him anyways so uh he got a um he got an invitation from his father-in-law um after about a year of marriage to go on a hunt in missouri and he had never been hunting in the 80s late 80s right you, you if you don't know somebody who hunts, you don't hunt. Uh, so he, he went with them. Uh, he got to know his brothers-in-law much better. Uh, and he's still close with all of them. Um, so you, you kind of fast forward just a few years. And when I was like eight, he brought me out for my first time. I went out a couple times without a gun. And then when I was like nine, um, I, I took my hunter safety course. Ten years old, went out, didn't have any success. And then when I was 11, I took my first year. Um, but I mean, the first, even the first time I was out there just with my dad without actively hunting, I was kind of hooked. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that experience, but really, I mean, what kept me in the game that whole time was the family connection mm -hmm. again, cause it was, it, it, and when I say family, I mean, you know, your deer camp kind of grows, right? Close 100%. friends uh, now. Yeah. Now that dad's experience, uh, is, is improving and his relationships are improving. That's side of family. He's got permission to bring a couple of buddies and the whole thing kind of grows. And so some of the, you know, some of my quote unquote uncles growing up are like those deer camp buddies that were doing stupid stuff outside the camper kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, after the, you know, you know what I'm talking about. We're, I don't know. I, I don't know. Could you tell me? Uh, I, I, I'm just uh, kidding. Just, just what happens at deer camp men. stays at deer camp, man. Yeah, middle-aged um, white men in their underwear, <laughs> right. we, 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 that kind of stuff. But um, so, so now we keep going with that, right? Because what I realize um, is that, like, th that that old kind of old guard was always doomed to fail because they weren't really ever uh, outside of immediate family members or um, if, if, you know, again, if you like grow up or marry into like a rural family, you're not going. It's just, that's not the way that the model was built. And there's sort of these, um, 
there there is some cultural elements in that uh, that have been exacerbated over the years with like social media and all that but there's always been kind of like a rural and city like urban divide i feel like mm -hmm. you know what i mean like culturally it's like yeah it's, there's this weird kind of us versus them mentality it's that's actually it's driven me more and more to just put my head down and do the work because we rely so heavily on each other mm -hmm. you know with i mean if you think about I mean, a vast majority of the food production happens in those communities, and yet there's a lot of people that are, you know, whether it be socially, it's usually more politically, uh, or whatever, Those they allow those divisions to kind of, like, taint their image of the people on the quote-unquote other side of the fence, right? And realistically, it's like, well, you, you probably wouldn't have any food without them. And then the flip side is that those those people producing the food kind of rely on the people in the cities to market, distribute, package, consume a vast majority of that food. And so that's, I mean, just that connection right there is enough. Mm -hmm. I, I've said connection like five times, but that's, those are the things that I've been learning as I've continued to do this. So, you know, you, you get forward in the timeline, <laughs> I'll make this like a 30 second version. I, I, Got into like music and drums in high school because I was 155 pounds and knew that the NFL wasn't going to be an option. I got a liberal arts degree, you know, racked up uh, like forty thousand dollars of liberal arts debt. I uh, got a worthless degree. Struggled for you know the first half of my 20s, kind of bouncing around, selling cars, being a barista, like basically taking any job that I could get, trying to move up. All the while, sort of touring and you know going through the Midwest and up through like your neck of the woods uh, in like Pennsylvania and New York and Jersey doing some touring and kind of enjoying that, but realizing like, this is not, this is probably never going to pan out as a career option. I always knew that. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed it, but it's like, at some point I need to like, <laughs> I need to pay these bills. Uh, so I uh, went and I, I worked on cruise ships for a couple of years where I met my, my wife. Uh, I was working on Royal Caribbean ships. I've also worked for Holland America line. Um, and I love that. And ironically enough, it, it just got a little too easy. <laughs> just playing the drums for three, four hours a day, five, six days a week. Yeah. And just, you know, sandy beaches and the whole thing. Um, <laughs> Sounds horrible. Yeah. Was, uh, uh, and I really enjoyed it. But actually, um, and my wife's job is a lot harder on that ship. Um, she's more like a like an entertainment host. And she teaches like you know, Zumba kind of dance fitness classes and all that stuff. So she's a lot more like in front of the gas, like 10, 12 hours a day, six wow. and a half days a week. Yeah. Very different lifestyle from the, the drummer sipping on a Mai Tai, you know, when it <laughs> sets over. Uh, we still loved it, but it was like, we we're just kind of ready to move on. So what we did, um, I had a lot of time on those, on those ships, on those contracts. And I was just kind of reading a lot of book. Re well, listening to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts and stuff. I found this guy, Tim Ferriss. Yep. You know him? Yep. Yeah, so uh, I don't know him personally. I've heard him talk. Yeah, well, yeah, he's. I'd recommend his podcast for anybody who's kind of in a rut, just like, you know, personally or socially mindset, or whatever mindset stuff. Yeah, yeah, he just gets you in the right spot. Um, and I found him through his podcast, but it, it, his podcast really came after like a, he had a couple of best-selling books, and um, so there's one that's kind of like purposely self-helpy sounding called the five, uh, the four-hour work week. And uh, basically, there's a lot of exercises in there to be like, well, you know, if you, like the kind of questions that people ask you, but you never really sit down and answer. Like, if money was taken care of, how would you spend your time? Where would you, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And because most of the most people, you know, the, the, after a week or two, you just get bored sitting on a beach. That's why most cruises are seven to ten days. Mm -hmm. Right? Those Caribbean cruises are great for like a reset, clear your mind, drink some alcohol, and then by the third day, you're like, I don't even want to drink anymore. I just want to relax and enjoy and read this book. And just like be ready for work because we we need purpose right mm -hmm. that uh, the maslow maslow hierarchy yeah yep you kind of like once you take care of like the food the you know all that stuff it, it becomes more like purpose oriented and helping people and and you know finding harmony in 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 nature those those kinds of things those sort of like hokey sounding ideals because a lot of us never really get there Right. I'm not there, but I, I realize, well, regardless of whether or not I get to that place where I'm just like helping people and all, you know, all those things, I'm still going to be happier having tried. Right. And so through, through uh, reading that book, I, uh, I actually did write the notes and put the work in. I came up with a concept because one of the questions was, you know, 
Like, wh- what's something you're really good at? Like, I don't know if I'm that good at it, but I've been hunting forever. And uh, I realized there's not there's not that much reliable content. There's a ton of disjointed content out there. Like, you can you can search how to do anything on YouTube or Google. You can find a blog post, right? Like, I can become a better cupcake decorator in a couple hours. <laughs> right. But that's a skill to call myself like a baker or a chef. That's a skill set. That's a, that's a whole other thing. And that's, I think that's maybe where a lot of beginners kind of get it wrong is that they, they want to be able to just search a blog post, you know, read, a, read a couple blog articles, YouTube posts or whatever, and think that they can go out and do this. And I'm not saying you can't do that, but you're setting yourself up for failure. And I, I, I mean, you probably know just as many people as I do who are like, they, you know, I might have known them for a year or two, but because I lived in the city of Chicago, if I didn't bring it up, they're like, "You hunt? Oh my god, I tried that a couple of years ago, and I couldn't, I couldn't even get past square, you know, square one." Yeah. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to get the tags. They're like, "Well, when'd you do it? Oh, I did it in August." Well, here in Illinois, if you're gun hunting, you're already way too late for that and in most states that's the case Mm -hmm. you might be able to get an over-the-counter tag so there's this like kind of steep pathway to entry and i just realized well you know even if i'm not producing entirely original content i mean all all the stuff that we we do is is original in that i'm uh, it's all written by me and or my brother and it's all recorded and filmed by me and and or some other set of (laughs) we'll call them characters Mm -hmm. um that that helped me kind of discuss these like 35 plus lessons but i decided you know what i I feel like rather than letting people do this patchwork quilt guessing game bs online just get bounced around from affiliate link to affiliate link because there's there's you know a lot of that content is is very geared towards like a lot of it is produced by Mm -hmm. or sponsored by brands um guide services and products so and that's not how you learn how to do something. I'm not saying there's not good information out there. I use that stuff myself, but it's all geared towards experienced hunters who have a tree stand and have problems with it, who have a grunt call, have problems with it, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And so it's like, here, try this. This is, you know, it's a little more expensive or it has these other features. You know, it, are you having X, Y, Z problems? Yes, I am. But that the beginner hunter has never been out there. They don't even know that they're having that problem. They don't even even know to ask that question. They don't even know how to use the damn thing. So that was that was where I was like, yeah, we gotta. You know what? There's a lot of people out there that want to do this. I know whitetails. Whitetails are ubiquitous across almost every state, and they're the most accessible. You don't have to have like these super these backcountry skills to go out and get them. You just need to put a little bit of time in. So I put it together. Um, you know, I came up with the concept of zero from zero to deer hunter in 30 days or your money back. Nice. Yeah. And that's the concept. If you're willing to sit down and spend 45 minutes or an hour, you know, every day or at your own pace, every other day, three days a week, right. In a month or two, you, I promise you will be like eons ahead of where you would have been in three years on your own just kind of happening upon this stuff and stumbling right. in the dark Yeah, because i mean your average hunter is only getting out like if you're a new hunter i think you know we're all and i heard somebody talk about this recently that in the world that we're in and hunting we're listening to all the same people and all those same people are ultimately like their only passion is hunting so yes we spend 25 30 plus days a year in the woods chasing what we're passionate about. But if you're somebody Mm -hmm. new, you might only have opening weekend, or maybe that's the only thing you can do because you have a demanding job that works odd hours, or you can't get time off like teachers. You know, all they have is weekends. They can't take time off because their time off is during the summer. So if you're, if you're one of those individuals without a program such as yours, it's like, where do you, it's going to take you 10 years to accumulate that just baseline information if you don't have, you know, if you didn't start when you were six years old walking in your father or your grandfather or your uncle or whoever's footsteps, right? Yeah, and if I wanted to be frustrated, I'd just go play golf. <laughs> right. Right, like, I mean, hunting hunting any species is, it's pretty hard, but, it, like, it's, like, it's also easy. Like, once you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. once you've done it for a while, it's, like, you almost have to question your own assumptions about what you know, even about your own land. 
or like in, in our case, land that we've had permission on for eight years. And it's like, you got to walk that stuff every once in a while. Features change. Right. Neighbors change stuff. They, they plant new stuff. There's, there's, the, the world is not static. Yeah. The one thing constant is change. So, you know, you, there's like some old wooden stands that like, eh, I'll go up there maybe once or twice a year now. We were hunting those every single year, like almost every hunt mm -hmm. for the first couple of years that we were hunting that property with guns only. And then my, my brother, younger brother, Jake, started bow hunting because he was tired of only being able to really go there. You could, you, there was a, there is a gun season for, you know, for the public lands in Illinois, but we're talking about one of the more populous states in the union mm -hmm. with one of the least uh, percentages of public land. 4% of our state is publicly owned mm -hmm. and, and 75% of that is state land, 1% national wow. federal, federal land. So you imagine going out there and we have two weekends, two, like three, a three day and a four day weekend a year for firearms that's it and then if you have a muzzle loader you get one more that's crazy every yeah. they call it they, they talk about that orange army we're like no nah, we're not hunting public land with you know what i mean like it's just different and that that does vary so i mean you can do it even in, in illinois but you you better know a couple other folks and be be willing to do it like the deer drive style because there's going to be people everywhere right that's not the experience that i really value anymore if the goal for me was like, man, let's just go out and just get a deer, then yeah, like that's an effective means of doing it. But like I said, for me, I've, I've taken, and I'm not looking down on anybody who does it differently. I just, I enjoy going out there either just me or, you know, now me and my wife, she's helping me film or something. We got a couple of like double platforms, kind of mm -hmm. like you see on, on the TV shows, um, like a little tree arm and stuff. It's a lot easier, you know, when she's got the camera in her hand. Cause I get busted like twice as oh, often now sure. if I have the bow and I'm trying to like pull this, you know, the octopus thing, I've, <laughs> I've actually gotten quite a bit of good footage, but three quarters of the time I get too focused on like, Oh yeah, I'm filming. Should I take a shot? at some point? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I got yeah. the kid, like the deer is like looking all perfect. And anyway, so there's, there's enough challenges uh, to that, but I just, I really love being out there because you see a lot of activity from the deer side. You see a lot of other wildlife and just the more time you spend out there, it's, you know, it's kind of its own scouting too, mm -hmm. making little trips back and forth from the stand or maybe, maybe taking a different route, those kinds of things. You, you pick up on some sign or you realize like, oh, they've been smelling me from over here because I have to pass right by this bedding area and the wind is coming this direction. Mm -hmm. These are concepts that we cover kind of high level just to introduce people and kind of get them in the back of their heads. So there's, that's the other thing I want to sort of like, you know, while we're talking about the program itself. Like, I, I just want to clarify, like, there's probably like, I don't know, twice as much information in there as a first year hunter really needs. Um, you don't have to like, you don't have to like soak it all up and just feel like, oh, I got to memorize all this before I can effectively go out. Um, ju just by virtue of like, you buy it once, it's yours. Like, you can go back, you can watch that stuff. And we link a lot of external articles that are going to explore some of these concepts deeper. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So like, um, I'll sit down like early on, you know, like the second lesson is about, Hey, make a decision. All right. Would you prefer to hunt with a firearm or archery equipment or maybe even like a crossbow, depending on where you're from. So we cover all that at, like conceptually, like, well, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the obstacles that you'd, you'd be likely to face with a gun versus a bow? What are some of the benefits, drawbacks, et cetera, so that we can help you, you know, you sit there for 20 or 30 minutes listening to me and my brother Jabberjaw, and you go, oh, okay, I think I, I, I've taken down these four or five notes. Like, I have a pretty good pros and cons list. I can make an educated decision now. Even though you don't have to go out and buy our, the, the purchase of a gun or a bow isn't until four lessons later, mm -hmm. right? You're, yeah, you're, you're kind of planting that seed for them to make that yeah, decision. Yeah, because, because it informs, like, how you apply for your tags, when you apply for your tags, where you can hunt, when you can hunt, all those things. But if you don't know to even ask those questions, it's reasonable to think. Like I, I've actually met more than one guy here in Illinois that, that I'm like, man, why didn't you just ask me? Like, I didn't know you hunted. And they, they went to the store. They spent all this time, like weeks researching like the best rifle. You can't hunt with a rifle in Illinois. <laughs> right, right. You know, so he spent all that time. Then he went to the gun store and he went, he, you know, he's like, am I getting the right ammunition? The guy's, yeah. And he's like all the way this close to like checking out. And he's like, so what are you going to be using this for? He's like, I'm going hunting whitetails this season. And it was like the summer. And he was like, here in Illinois. 
And the guy had to start from scratch and he's like, to hell with this, I'm out. Yeah. You know, and we lose right. so many people like that. Right. So that's it. That that's kind of the value that I'm talking about with the curriculum is like we're going to walk you through some of those things so you can go, oh, I get it because it, it makes sense. Like once somebody explains it to you, but there's so many things like that, little trip ups. It's like little snares. You're just walking through a minefield of ways to not go hunting this year. If you start with us, we're going to link you to like a gazillion other stuff, uh, you know, articles and blogs and YouTube uh, posts that are really specific on that thing we're talking about that particular day mm -hmm. you can choose to to read or watch a video or not you're going to be fine either way yeah and then as you progress through the process we're going to introduce you to how to like find places to shoot your weapon and yeah you know, and and organizations like you know i'm sure you and i'll talk about backcountry hunters and anglers right? mm -hmm. i'm a member you know i'm a member of two other organizations too and like i've taken so much more personally than i ever intended i joined those those organizations like wanting to help and then i truly feel like i've taken more from my own you know i've gotten hunting opportunities out of it i've, I've gotten advice on where to go on public land right all these things and i'm like this was worth 25 bucks like 10 times over oh yeah you know i, I would pay i would pay more than that yeah don't the, tell them the membership fees <laughs> just alone and the relationships that you make by going to these sort of events you know mm -hmm. you know take the organizations out of it you go to a collection of people if you go to a BHA pint night or you go to a NWTF banquet or a QDMA Or an archery event, range. Or an archery range, right. You know, like now, just where hunters, people with camouflage hats congregate. I'm curious. You're going you're gonna to meet somebody. I'm curious your opinion on this because I feel like, so you speak about archery ranges. What are your thoughts on the one, archery ranges and, and gun um, gun clubs, I feel like are kind of a, of an, are an old crowd right now. And I feel yeah, like you walk in there and you don't necessarily feel that welcomeness that you do when you go to an event where people are coming together. It's almost like a, like, it's almost like you walk into that local towny bar and everybody mm -hmm. turns around and they're like, who the hell are you? And like, <laughs> yeah. That's, that actually happened to me here in Eagle. Yeah. So it's, I think I've personally experienced that. And I think if you're an external a new hunter or coming into this or a new shooter, you don't necessarily get the warm and fuzzy sometimes walking into those sort of places. And yeah. I don't know. I, I think yeah. it's something that needs to change because, and I don't know how to change right, but, it. But how do you change it? Right. You how can't you, change how you, how you it. Change that? I think you need, well, you, I think you need more youth in some of these organizations. I mean, I go to some of these places and it's like, it's my, my grandfather's age generation. And they're like, Oh, these, you know, these kids coming in here and it's like, we need a place to go. Cause it's like, we're <laughs> yeah. the future of this. Like, this we gotta... is it, man. Like you better, you better do a better job making it nice for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the first of those organizations I joined was pheasants forever, uh, quail forever, our, our chapter there in Illinois is dual chapter. Um, and you know, my dad, my brother and I were, were basically just helping like with the youth shoots. Like, so our chapter is really focused on, I say our, but I'm, you know, I'm Colorado resident now. Um, I still keep in touch with those guys. And, and there's still most of the events, I would say three quarters of the events throughout the year that the, the chapter puts on is ladies shoots and youth shoots. Mm -hmm. So there are other people that are welcome, but that's, it's pretty obvious there, right? Like people are going to be more comfortable where the birds of a feather type of thing. And that's again, part of the problem is you, there's probably something wrong there if you are like 60 years old and you're hanging out with a bunch of 22 year olds so, but that's that's what the gap has yeah, has kind of created become, yeah. right so it is kind of on us and i've heard you guys talk about this on your your show as well and it's but it's kind of obvious like when you think about it you're like well yeah it's they're not going to fix it it's too late you know and by the way like it, it's kind of on full display nothing against the guys in my chapter but like i've tried introducing some new methods of fundraising for instance or right. way, you know what i mean different right. ways to like um because they, they just rely so heavily on uh primarily one night a year and then like some raffles and stuff. right exactly yeah. you know there's there's big games and all that stuff and it's like cool now we got this bankroll of 22 grand for the whole year yeah and, and they just like, sit well, back and that's it you know <laughs> yeah and it's like they, they'll listen but nothing ever happens and that's actually part of why i was like so excited to get involved with BHA uh, is is a very young organization, and it's being built by younger people. Mm -hmm. People, you know, uh, probably the median age for B 
BHA member is probably somewhere right around us, which yeah. is very young compared to all the other old, organizations. Yeah. QDMA is doing a pretty good job, I feel like, with the field of work thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, that's that's fairly local. It's going to take them some time right. to to grow that. So again, I'm so happy. I don't see these things as competition. This I, I'm very much of the rising tide mentality, right? It's going to raise all ships um, because not everybody necessarily wants to learn you know, from the comfort of their own home, but I'm pretty sure some people do, yeah. especially with that social, social anxiety factor until you're, you know, cause it, it sucks going to a new place. I can't tell you how many times I, you know, I was just like, man, I really want to see this band when I was in my twenties and all my friends were getting like knocked up and moving away or married <laughs> yeah. and stuff, you know? And I'm like, anybody want to go with me? No. And I was like, I just found myself sitting in my apartment one night when I was like 26 years old. I'm like, I'm too young for this. Yeah. What am I doing? I'm not ready to just like give up, you no. know? And so I just started showing up to the places on my own. I know that's a big step um, for some people. So, again, I, because I felt that. I've been there. So we baked that in. We baked that into the course. There's actually I, – I dedicated an entire um, lesson to just, like, um, habitat and hunting organizations. Okay. So we go through several of them, give you a ton of links. You know, give you, uh, there's some B-roll of us at, at, like, again, youth shoots and, and doing that kind of stuff. It's a good time, man. You can, You just show up. And it, the hardest part is that. You the know, hardest part is showing for sure. Yeah. It's just getting yourself to be like, oh, what's going to happen? Like, nothing's going to happen, man. They're going to they're gonna instruct you very well. It's going to be the best instruction you could probably ever get for free. Yeah. Right? Or for very, very cheap. You might have to pay for the target loads or whatever. They may even have, like, we have guns, different sizes of guns that the members, the, the board members bring to those shoots. So you don't even have to have a gun yet. In some cases, or if you're not sure, just email the contact. Hey, I was thinking about coming to this thing. I promise, man, you're gonna have a great time, and it's gonna open doors for you. Yeah. You know, you're you're welcome to go there without a membership in most cases, and that's kind of like the draw. They're gonna, tr- I don't right. want to say they, guilt, but they're well, gonna, they get they're you, they and, get you in the door, and yeah. then they're like, hey, you know, if you if you like this, join our organization type thing. You know? And most of those annual memberships are between twenty and forty bucks. Like, yeah. if you don't have that, you're you're probably not in a position to get started hunting, anyways. Yeah. Right. Um, because you know, the, we're going to advise you to to do you know to take a couple lessons, like whether it be you know shooting your your rifle or shotgun or uh, you know uh, compound bow, crossbow, whatever uh, that you choose, assuming it's legal which we also cover. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll, we'll show you how to research that stuff. But, you know, there's certain things you can't, you can't give a haircut over the phone, right? So not that you are. I, you yeah, know. we don't have to worry about that. But <laughs> <We're>, hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically speaking, yeah. We got the same barber. Um, <laughs> that's an old man joke too. Uh, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's just creating basically like a framework. That, that's what Whitetail 101 is in a nutshell. It's just a framework for somebody to kind of like lean back on and go, okay, like I'm going to learn a couple of things. Today. I just sit here and I read five minutes of text. I watch John jab, at, you know, jab at me for 15 or 20 minutes. And I've taken five notes and I go, at the end, he goes, well, go do this. I'm like, I don't feel like it yet. And I'll say, well, then don't take the next lesson yet. Yeah, you know, when, when you're you ready. feel like doing that, yeah, yeah when, when you feel like going on, you know, your DNR website, do what you need to do, or going, you know, purchasing your firearm, or, you know, learning what ammunition is supposed to go into it, or uh, or go and practice with your weapon, and so forth, so on, so forth, scouting, or whatever that step is. If you don't feel like doing it yet, that's fine. Do it on your own time. Just make sure you don't wait too long. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So kind of wrapping up talking about whitetail 101 so what are where where can people find that what's the best you know obviously you have an instagram and a facebook page mm-hmm. for just what's going on with whitetail 101 and kind of your social your uh, personal life side of it but uh you know if, as far as the website and getting the program and stuff like that where do they yeah, go uh, the, the website is sportsman 101.com okay um and the whitetail 101 guide um is 49 dollars you can get it. You can get the first section for free, and you can preview the first lesson of every single section for free. So you just uh, just click on the the course there, or go to it's sportsman101.com slash p slash whitetail dash one hundred and one. Yeah, and we'll put that um, so, we'll put that in both in the the link for this podcast or the, when we post the podcast. I'll put that in there as well as um, yeah in our profile. I'll put it on our it, link. So I'll put it on you, our link yeah, tree as well. There's a there, there's like a free version of the course that you get like this whole. Billy and I have been talking about um, like the license and tags kind of safety section. That's section one. So there's like eight sections of the course. Uh, you can get the, the entirety of section one for free, uh, at, which is honestly, that's the reason we did it first is because usually that's the most time sensitive 
thing. Like we're coming to the end of February. Some states are already starting to open their um, their tag lotteries. Like sure. you can apply now. Uh, Illinois, I think, is March into April. You know, so like that's the thing is you. I know people are like, you, you probably appeal to like mostly, you know, Northeast hunters. Right. But I feel like everybody listening to your podcast knows at least one, probably five people who are like, yeah, I think I might, I would go. But again, the, the social anxiety thing or like they don't want to impede on your guys' friend group. You know, it, it sounds like you guys have a really great, like big, robust deer camp. But at a certain point, the land just isn't really going to support right. much more hunting. You're probably degrading your experience. So I, all that plays into it. Mm-hmm. So if you got, but if you guys, you know, you guys listening to this have people like that, you can be like, hey, you know, check this out. And you go through the course over the course of the next couple of months. I promise you, you as the mentor, the guy taking a risk on somebody going out there, you're going to have a better time too. Yeah. Because this person is going to be way far ahead. So anyways, if, uh, all you got to do is just basically enroll uh, for free and enter your email address. Um, and then we'll badger, badger you, you know, every week or two to actually complete the course and become a hunter. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, sportsman101.com. Awesome, and then Instagram is whitetail underscore 101. Facebook, same thing, uh, whitetail101 underscore sportsman101. So you, if, if you type any combination of whitetail101, sportsman101, you'll find us. You'll find you. Yep. Awesome. Well, I will definitely put all the information in our when I post all this stuff up, make sure people have an easy ability to find you guys through the links. So before we get talking about some hunting stories, I got to go to the little boy's room. So I'll be right back. All right, cool. Just hold with me for a second. Yep. Beautiful. My eyeballs are floating. Holy shit. <laughs> I've been drinking a lot of water lately. I'm, I'm well, training. I'm, I'm on a training plan for a half marathon trail run that I do every spring. So I'm, Oh, crushing water right now so dang cheers to that this That's, is not beer this is sparkling water good for you man yeah so we uh so i had given you a few questions to kind of throw out there that we could chat about and let's see here yeah, fire away what, what did we already so we kind of we kind of already talked about you know your driving reason for starting the program cross that one off so the next one that I wanted to chat about, just from following along with you over the last month, I can see that that the food side of things is definitely a huge driver for you. Um, you post some pretty, you know, what's the right word? It makes my mouth water when I see the stuff that you're posting pictures of. I'm like, God damn, I'm hungry right now. So I'll say straight up, I'm a better cook than I am a hunt, but I still kill multiple deer every year, hey, so it's good enough. Like we <laughs> talked about, there's more time to cook than there is to hunt, so... Just there gotta, is, and just it's a better sure. recruiting tool. It is. So, yeah, so what, what does your connection to food, you know, what that side of hunting, what does that all mean to you? And I think I'd kind of like to hear a little bit more about, you know, your wife being a vegetarian. Is she now into eating the venison, or is she still fighting, fighting the fight on that one? Yeah. Uh, my wife's name is Ilse. She, uh, it was more for health reasons. You know, she just, she just wasn't getting enough of certain nutrients. Um, and more of like a vegetarian and then eventually kind of pescatarian diet. The issue is, <clears throat> I think she would agree with me. She doesn't really prefer the taste of like dark meat. Mm. There's a kind of a, I think it's probably more of a texture thing at this stage. She had kind of a traumatic experience growing up in Mexico where basically her, her pet bat, her pet sheep got, Oh boy. It took, took the ax, uh, and her cousin's quinceanera. <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, she, she, yeah, she walked in the kitchen the whole thing. So oh, um, it's no. understandable. Yeah, you know, best splayed out across the the counter. But um, oh, so it took her a while to get over that one. Uh, um, so I'm proud of her for helping me film my uh, my skinning and butchering videos. Yeah, no kidding. But. Uh, she and I, you know, we, we see eye to eye on a lot of this stuff. When I, when I first explained, you know, my reasons for doing it and kind of, I mean, especially down in Mexico, it's just, and and so many other countries besides America, it's just not a part of the culture. Even here, it's not a part of like a lot of urban culture, but I realized like actually a lot of urban people wind up getting access to wild game meat and wild harvested stuff. I was listening just literally just yesterday, I was listening to, um, Randy Newberg like a uh, hunt talk podcast. And yeah. he had, uh, this guy on there. How was the guy's name? Hang on. I'm fine. Shane Mahoney. He's like my new favorite person. 
Yeah, he's. Hey, you should probably have him dude. on instead of wasting your time with schmucks like me. Uh, ah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, said it, not like, me. Yeah, yeah and you were easier to get than Shane Mahoney, or yeah, he's only Randy. an internationally recognized you know, <laughs> right. scholar or whatever. Um, but he's doing really great work, and, and um, their preliminary research suggests that, like, out of the roughly thirty, I think we had like thirty six, thirty eight million hunters last year. Um, there's probably, you know, you could reasonably extrapolate that into something like two hundred plus million people consuming wild game meat because. How many people do you feed on a given year? Right. I probably feed ten or more. I, you know, I might bring it like a pot roast into the office for the other guys. Uh, I'll have people over for dinner. I'll, I'll try to make friends with other hunters. Yeah. And invite them over, right? And and so if I if I harvest two deer and I have two deer in my deep freezer, I personally probably can consume half to two thirds of one of it. And so the rest of that goes to my family, my friends, coworkers, that kind of thing. And so uh, what I'm trying to accomplish there, I mean, I always enjoyed sharing it because it's something that people don't really get all that much. And the older we get, the more we know to ask those questions about where's the food coming from, what's going into it, what's in it that doesn't need to be there. And if you look at the back of any label of almost anything that you can purchase from like a packaged, you know, food product now, it's like, yuck. Yeah. Right. Like, why does this have broth in it? It's chicken breast it's a chicken breast like what why did we add salt and broth it's you know they're just cutting corners and it's like well i don't want broth i want chicken breast right um and so forth so you know i pretty much like substituted beef altogether i won't turn my nose up to a t-bone if somebody's like grilling steaks uh, you know i'm not like no i don't do that <laughs> uh but I, I try to not make it a regular part of my diet especially like you know ground processed foods that i that I didn't make myself. So like right. I make sausage, I will purchase like pork shoulder, like fatty pork, um, and run it through the grinder and make, you know, whip up different recipes and, and, and go to the butcher and get the casing and the whole thing. I love doing that. I saw that, you know, you guys were doing that this past week. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Meaty treats. Uh, but I, I gotta know what's going in there is, is really what it comes down to. And I think more and more people are realizing like, yeah, this could affect me very, very seriously. Like, Sooner than later, actually. Was there was um, there like a turning point or something that happened with you, or was it was always like that growing up for you, or that was kind of how you were raised? No, nah, no, nah, my dad, my parents still like eat plenty of beef and all that. For me, it's just that I, I, don't know, I, I, I think I, I, I keep a thumb on what's going on, um, like environmentally, you know. Just I, I think all those things from all the questions you learn to start asking, actually, for me, they they derived from hunting because a lot of people, if I ask you like, where'd this come from? It'd say city market, <laughs> right. That's all they <laughs> the know, grocery yeah. store, right? Like, yeah, like it came from, what do you mean? It came from the cellophane package. Well, where, where did it come from? And if you continue asking those questions very quickly, you get, you get to like, mm, like, what do they call that? Like square, not square one. Um, ground zero. Ground zero. Thank you. And uh, you, you don't always like what you find there. Right. You know, I'm talking to you on an iPhone. Uh, you know, uh, designed in USA, assembled in China. But where did all the parts come from? Where did the lithium ion come from? Right? Where, what mine did that come from? How are those workers being treated? There's all these questions you start asking. You're like, oh, God. It's like, it really is a rabbit hole. Yeah. So, but but it's easier to do that with food because it's something you consume. Most of us consume two to five times a day. So if you're asking that question often enough, eventually it's going to start to, to wear away right. and, and take away at that facade of like, I don't, you know what, like every, every living thing exists at the cost in, in some way, shape or form of the health or benefit of another living thing, whether it's an animal, plant or, you know, fungi or otherwise. Right. And when it, when it comes to the food side of it, that's one of the few things that we have direct control over what we put in our bodies and everybody literally has that choice. And if you want to procure your own meat by going out and killing an animal, you can do that. If you want to grow a garden in your backyard and you have the, the whereabouts to do that, or you can participate in a community, let's say you live in an urban area, but the corner lot, they set up a community garden. Like you can literally, that's a, one of the few things you use the, the iPhone example. You or I are not going and we're not, 
building an iPhone so we can have this conversation. We need someone else to do that for us. But food mm-hmm. is one of those few things that if you want to, you can. And I think that's where you're starting to see a lot of this, you know, everything you're saying and what we're talking about, we're starting to see that, that turn of the tide where more of our generation is asking those questions and they're seeing those documentaries. And it's like, if I don't have to eat that process stuff, why? And I can go do this. Let me learn how to do this. Insert, you know, white tail one one or, you know, going and learning how to do something so you can procure that food yourself. Yeah. And I mean, you know, conveniently a deer is probably right at the, the crosshairs of like easiest to procure compared with like, again, some of those, those, Western big game species that exist in those really hard to reach spots. Mm -hmm. And you have to have another set of sub skills that I'm actually like learning now. Right. And I'm excited to do those things, but like, I've kind of been preparing from like, you know, figuring out how, like how the heck to get your draw or preference points in, uh, in place for whichever, you know, system that particular state has in place all the way up through, you know, the backcountry skills and learning how to properly glass a ridge, where to get up on top and, um, get a good vantage and how to approach and thermals and all that stuff. So there's like, that's, that's harder. I'm not saying it's hard, hard, but it's going to take more time. I may not be successful this year, but I'm going to practice what I preach. I'm going to go out to my property, the property I went on hunting in advance. I'm going to scout. I'm going to try to find some sign. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to try and corroborate that right before my hunt starts and just count on, you know, the unexpected happening. Yeah. Um, when it comes to whitetails, you know, you can you can make some reasonable guesses, and because a whitetail's range is smaller, but they cover so much more ground, you can almost get lucky. Like if you if you know if, if you just identify one or two potential food sources, and you have a good block of timber and a water source, there's a pretty darn good chance there's deer living there, unless there's something killing them or like poisoning them. Yeah. Now it's just a matter of like, okay, find the sign, hunt near the sign. Yeah. If you have no success, find another place, hunt there. Uh, so it's, it's nice that, you know, it's, it's a combination of the, the ease of use, we'll say, com- combined with, um, like you get to take a lot off the animal because yeah. you could go out, like you don't really need any preparation or even camouflage to go out with a 22 and hunt squirrels, right? Or doves. Those are easier. You basically just walk around until you find some and you kill them. But it's, it's, uh, squirrels are like the bluegill of <laughs> exactly yeah. of hunting you know you got you, your all your time and work and effort is in the uh the skinning and and filleting kind of preparing them whereas you do all that work up front once and you have this huge cache of meat right it's not an elk but like take two or three deer and you've got an elk absolutely yeah so that's you know that that's also the appeal is like as far as big game hunting i mean they call deer like medium-sized game but like as, as far as like bigger larger game hunting goes this is it man it's available to most of us, yeah, within a, a pretty short drive, especially in the eastern two thirds of the country, right. At uh, you know, at pr- probably the cheapest rate you you can get, especially if you're hunting in your own state. You don't have to pay those out of ta- out of state license and tag fees and stuff. You know, you go on your DNR website, you find a couple of uh, wildlife management areas within a couple hours drive, and you go. You take a walk. You, you take our advice on where to you know where potentially to, to sort of try to suss out ahead of time. You just take a nice long leisurely walk, and you look for deer sign, <laughs> right. and you're you're already halfway there. Like yeah. this, it's not rocket science. There's just none of this stuff is like that's the great thing too. So this stuff is not super complex. There's just a lot of steps. There's a lot of little things that you need to know. And if you, I mean, you and I probably st- I still blow a hunt maybe once a year because I forgot something stupid. There's just a lot of little things. And if you have a process built in, right? Like you're that's that's eighty five percent probably more 90% of your, your likelihood of success any given day. And then the rest is just what the hell the deer are doing and what is, what is driving their motivation, whether it be weather or neighbors or predators or any other set of factors that you have no control over, but 85 to 90% is like stuff you can control. And then it's just spending enough time in like a, like a high value, um, a high likelihood area until something walks past yeah, just you good right habitat direction. yeah absolutely yeah. and i think that's here in new york that's one of the things that i've found is that some of our state lands public lands that i've ventured into a lot of them are very very good deer habitat and even some of the smaller pieces you just got to get in there a little ways and you don't know what you're going to run into so if you're somebody that's listening to this and you're you know you are from new york or you're from pennsylvania 
we have chances are especially even close to you there's there's hundreds of acres of state-owned land that you can go out on and recreate and you know if you're in archery if you're in archery there's there's very little hunting pressure during archery on state land because most people that are very serious about hunting are archers and most of those people have private land or leases or something of that nature so Mm -hmm. what i'm seeing is that the heavy pressure of public land here in, in New York anyway is during gun. And even at that, it's only the first handful of days or prime hunting days of the year, be it the first weekend, the second weekend, Thanksgiving, that's it. Aside, aside from that, you can go take a walk on these pieces of property. And you know, if you're, if your goal is to put meat in your freezer so you can eat, like it's very attainable. It's yeah. You know, we don't, I don't, I don't want anybody to get the idea that this is like, just because I broke this down into so many steps, it's like this impossible process. It's, it's not, you just, you got to put a little bit of time in mm-hmm. like the, all, I, I think humans and I include myself, everybody in this statement, but humans, you know, by nature are sort of short sighted and we, we get really focused on what's right in front of us and we tend to push these things off. Well, if you really want to make meaningful changes, you know, it's, the success of mine or Billy's hunts aren't are, are not usually determined from the time we step foot out the truck and onto that that state land. It's before then, yeah. and it's sometimes in some cases three, four, five months before then. And so, if you can appreciate that, that you don't have to put like an impossible amount of time, but you do have to put some time in up front. It's going to exponentially increase your odds of success. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you can't get lucky, but you're a lot more likely to get lucky every single time you go out there if you're better informed, better prepared, Absolutely. better educated. Yeah. You know. 100%, man. All right, let's let's tell some hunting stories. You had you <laughs> gave me uh you gave me uh a list of some hunting stories here. So you had a couple big buck <laughs> stories that you wanted to share. Well, we'll start with the, you know, my biggest buck of my life. Um uh, you, can probably find it on the, the Instagram page. Um, I mean, honestly, before then, the biggest one I ever took was like he uh, scored in the one twenties when I was like seventeen. You know, so three seasons ago now. Um, I uh, I was having a rough season. It was actually my second year out with a bow. I had spent a ton of time, mostly on um, on that that wildlife management area land, that state land we were talking about. And, uh, I, I kept thinking like I was, you know, I, I could see the deer sign. There's fresh deer sign like that. I knew deer were there and I knew where some of them were bedded. And, uh, so I was getting in there and I even did a couple of all day sits and just never saw anything within that, that shooting light window for, for uh, I, I think in New York, you guys are one of the weird States where you yeah, have to it's like a thir- 30 minutes after sun up, right? Is that what you're talking about? Well, for us, yeah, it's like, so it opens, it's actually 30 minutes before official sunrise and then, uh, shooting like closes 30 minutes after official sunset. Like you got to use like a naval right. time, t- timetable for like your coordinates. Um, but yeah, I, like I would see deer getting, when I was like getting down, it was like, man, it's, I'm still not, I still haven't found a pocket. Or like it's not pressured enough for me. I mean, I'm, you know, at the time I was living in the south suburbs of Chicago and I was only driving like an hour to get to this place. So there's still quite a few people out there. You could see it with the, the number of vehicles or whatever. But anyway, so we're like, we're getting into mid, uh, mid-November at this point. And I had one real opportunity. I'm like a young spike. And I chose, you know, I'm like, nah, I'm not going to take that. And then that was like two weeks prior and I'm dying now. Cause I'm like, nah, I have no meat. I'm going to wind up with no meat. <laughs> We're getting, you know, into like, like what we think is, is becoming like post rut. It, truth is we we're, were probably right there at the peak. And my brother's feeling bad for me. Cause he's already taken two does. He's had a couple of like pretty decent encounters, like far off encounters that didn't quite work out with very, very mature bucks in various stands. I'm like, damn, you know, uh, so I'm all frustrated. And he's like, you know, I'll go sit in my stand. He's like, I, I see deer there like literally like 80% of the time. You, you're going to see deer. If you sit in that stand twice, you're going to see something within range. So I go over there. And by now it's like gun season. Yeah, it's the weekend of gun season. So I take the gun out there. And it's like 30 mile an hour wind gusts, like terrible wind gusts. 
And I'm like, he gives me the stand on this BS day, you know? <laughs> right. I'm like, of course he would. Um, and may, I don't know. I don't know if that was his motivation. Like, yeah, sure. Go over there. Like, you know, cause that was kind of his honey hole. It's right up against this, this Creek bed. There's a ton of bedding, like, um, yeah, about 200 yards off. Well, the wind was so crazy that day. Um, that I was like, well, the only thing worth doing, I'm literally like, I, I don't want to say I'm like giving up, but I'm like, well, what do I have to lose? So I have like the rattle, the rattle antlers. And I'm just like, clack, 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 beat the hell out of them, you know, every, for maybe like 30, 40 seconds, every 20, 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. And about eight fifteen in the morning, the, like a Goliath buck just kind of like steps out. I'm like, what is that? And gra- like, <laughs> uh, you know, Fortunately for me, you know, when I when I do any kind of calling sequence blind, because I had been having no luck, I actually don't usually advise people to do that un- unless you're trying to create some of your own luck. You know, it's a little easier to call to something that you can kind of read their body language and hope they'll come in to you. But I'm like, nah, caution in the wind, clack, clack, clack. Yeah, I'm not going to see a damn thing. And I, I hang them up and literally grab the gun. I, so I have the gun in my hands and I turn to my right and I'm like, oh, what? And... <laughs> out steps he scored 144 inches he was 21 yards away so it would have been like a perfect (laughs) bow shot and i'm like of course you know um i'm like you know i'll take it so i just met met, and i just stopped him for a quick second fired and watched that projectile go through because he was so close and then he just kind of like trotted off i was like no come on like i didn't even i didn't even chuck the shell you know i'm like Got He's him. dead. Yeah. Like, die. 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 No. Oh, okay. He's dead. <laughs> like, it just fell over, convulsed for about 20 seconds, and he was done. And I was like, I'm really glad I did not have time to think about that. Right. <laughs> you what, know, what, were you, what were you shooting? What did you have for a gun? Uh, it's an old uh, 1100 autoloader. So twelve games. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's because you say you guys can't use. Uh, yeah, yeah. In, in Illinois, we got to use those slugs. So we we uh, fitted. My dad actually um, inherited two of them from his uncle. He got like shocked with. He was an electrician. He got shocked like really bad, and he he couldn't take the recoil hmm. to hunt anymore. So we gave them to my dad when he started hunting. So those guns were like twenty years old. My dad got them. That's cool. And now you know, yeah, they were like forty something years old. That's um, awesome. We got two of them and. The, the one we fitted with a slug barrel. So, yeah, the uh, aim was true. It was great. And then, like, I was, like, almost, like, heartbroken. I was like, oh, my God, I didn't really even get to experience my biggest buck of my life. So then, my you know, my brother, of course, here's a shot. because He's hunting, like, four or 500 yards out. And uh, <laughs> my dad texts me. He's like, doe? He's like, wall hanger buck. Don't tell Jake. <laughs> So he, my, my brother, you know, because tradition is you go, you walk up on the kill, you know, okay, have a look at it. Maybe you take a photo or something and then help me field dress it. So we're all kind of standing over there and I see my brother walk and I'm like, eh, kind of pointing down. Hey, come on over here. <laughs> all right. Just like real casual, just the biggest dick move. <laughs> Cause he walks up like not expecting and he kind of looks down and there's, you know, like that look, he was like a dog in that like dogs can't hide their emotions. <laughs> right. Like the, he had no time to prepare for this moment. So he's like, he's like, duh, 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 like, yeah, uh, yeah, I saw a couple farther out, decided not to take the shot. I'm sure we'll see. So what the, f-? <laughs> and looks up at me like, you son of a, I'm like, I couldn't let it, I couldn't let it go, man. <laughs> right. You know, and we actually turned out we have that buck, uh, just twice on, on trail camera, um, but hadn't had them on for like several weeks. So okay. it's interesting because they say that the bucks, you know, they tend to like expand their range a little bit when they're when they're chasing tail. Right. And uh, so he might he might have been on a little bit of an excursion, and then just happened to roll through on, on the right at the right time. Maybe because of the wind. Maybe right. he's just hey, I'm just gonna go and get get back to my bed, and here I am like a like a jerk almost like just like obnoxiously <laughs> like clanking clanking the. Uh, the antlers together and he's like ah, see what's going on here maybe somebody's getting laid <sighs> no i shot him in the chest <laughs> right um yeah that i mean it was awesome but like truth be told that's 
the you know what I mean like the more the more memorable part of the experience was messing with my brother after the fact. Yeah, <laughs> that's what most of my owning stories are too. Is just like messing around at deer camp or um, you know after everybody's already tagged out or whatever. That's that's honestly that's like one of the goals for gun season for us now because all of us hunt archery, yeah. so we always have that buck tag. So do you so guys only few, have one buck tag in, in 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 Illinois? Well, it's a two buck tag state, but you can only get one per Weapon. medium. So if you yeah, so if you use a gun, you can only take harvest one buck with a gun, and then if you if you also archery hunt, you can only take one with with your archery equipment. Yeah, same here. Maximum. But well, a lot of times, what winds up happening is we'll take two does during gun season because it's just like it's yeah, such yeah. a short time. By that second weekend, it's like, okay, whatever I see, if it's, you know, if it's more than a, a, a fawn, like, it's coming with me. Right. You know, archery season, that's that's what has kind of opened this up a little bit more and become, frankly, for me, you know, if, if the goal is, like, if you know, efficiency of time in the woods, yeah, just, like, take the gun. You can shoot way farther, like, it's more effective, you know. Um, but I've, I've just enjoyed actually – almost having to spend a little bit more time out there because there's always that like that added i've seen so many more big bucks since i've started heart archery hunting. oh yeah no doubt um because because i became a better hunter i was kind of forced to do that to learn better and get closer um and really learn to read that deer sign and kind of you know I've, I've, as i said that that wasn't that's not the only buck i've called in i've actually had the most luck calling in bucks with the rattling antlers more than grunts or, or doe bleats or anything else um now that I think about it, but most of the time it's like, it's the younger ones. It's the, it's that two and a half year old that needs at least another year or two now before I'm like, and I, I got nothing against like taking a younger buck at all. Uh, I did a couple of years ago on the last day of gun season. Cause it was like, it was literally in the last two hours of, of that the season, that that tag was going to be uh, good. He was standing there broadside 25 yards for like literally three minutes. I'm like, Oh, well, nothing else is coming. Okay, <laughs> you know yeah. we'll take it. But you're, you're uh, we, we tried it, it, buddy. Yeah, like sorry, but I, I only have so much uh, control, so much reserve. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I only have one deer in the freezer so far. So guess what? You're my insurance policy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, usually we we try to let the some of the younger ones go, and over the last few years, that's worked out. You know, we don't have a ton of land to hunt on. Um, it's actually less than a hundred acres, and so and it's all the neighbors hunt. Even so. We haven't had those conversations with any of those folks, really. Mm -hmm. And the deer are still, we're still seeing more and more big, mature deer. Yeah. So there's something to be said for that. Even you know, if you're if not having those your conversations with your neighbors, I think a lot of people are thinking the same things and mm -hmm. making those decisions to, you know, if they want to, they're letting. And it, I heard something the other day, I was listening to, to Kip Adams talk about, I think he was on Wired to Hunt, listen to him give his, his State of the Union with whitetails and you know, I heard that one. It was really good. It was really good. And he was talking about letting letting those, even if you don't let every single yearling buck go, if you let a handful of those yearling bucks go, they become two and a half year olds next year. And then it mm -hmm. just it just starts compounding. And then a yeah, couple and that, of those two and a half year olds. Yeah, that whole thing about the social hierarchy. Yeah. So it's, it's like actually good for the deer herd. You know, we're thinking of this again from like a, a, a selfish perspective. Inches then you go, oh. Yeah. Yeah, it like might be yeah, exactly, like the antler growth standpoint. And that's what that's what motivates a lot of right. folks. But, you know, if we really want to call ourselves conservationists, I, I didn't know that until he said about the the social structure and I said, "Well, that makes a lot of sense, right?" Like cuz you see it you see it uh, again. If I'm if I'm rattling, I would say basically every time except for that one really big we, we think it was about a seven and a half year old buck coming in Every other time I've rattled in a buck, like during the rut, has been he's been two and a half years old or younger. Right. Because I, they fall for that stuff quicker. They're it's they're like adolescents. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Imagine you know, that if, if we had no adults in this world and it was all middle school and high schoolers, it'd be a freaking yeah. it'd be a god only you know it'd be a disaster. It's pretty much what you have in the woods if you don't have any mature deer. Well, that and especially especially if it required kicking an adult's ass to get laid. <laughs> right. That's, that's what they're, that's yeah. the stakes, right? Like, and you can't, you know it. Deer aren't, the, and here's the beauty about being a deer or wild animals that you don't have a mirror. So I've actually witnessed deer, like smaller, younger, just really aggressive three and a half year old deer scare off a larger deer. Right. Just because of their attitude. Cause he's just, he's yeah. just, yeah. Cause he doesn't know that he's smaller. He, he, that's why they, 
they have to that usually they spar right yeah. most of the time in nature like it's pretty cool to watch bucks actually fight but th- that's not how most of those end they'll like spar and they'll kind of size each other up and it's like you and me go on an arm wrestling contest if we're close in strength yes then we will fight but if i arm wrestle my wife who's 99 pounds and five foot one like we know pretty quickly who's yeah. who's bigger or stronger and that's that's i feel like that's kind of a, a big part of the what the antlers are there for is just like let's lock it up in a, in a way that hopefully isn't going to necessarily kill one of us right we know that that happens too but they're not trying to like it's not worth it if i know that i'm going to get my butt beat like i'll fight i don't really want to i'm mm-hmm. a lot more likely to fight if i know that i could kick somebody's ass and so if you know you're going to get beat like why would you and usually that ends in you know, in the smaller deer kind of running off and knowing again, okay, now he knows what that older buck smells like. That buck's scent is all over the place. And he knows like, well, like if I try to breed here, I'm going to get my butt kicked. <laughs> yep. So it's, oh, I'm going to go to the next, I'm going to go to the next, uh, the next block. Yeah. Maybe I'll, yeah, maybe. So I'll, I'll move on and keep going. But if, if there aren't any of those older bucks around, that's what Kip was saying, right? Is like that buck, that younger buck. Yeah. He can do a good job breeding lots of does but he may literally breed himself to death correct yeah. because bucks like by nature they just they kind of fast they don't spend much energy eating they're basically they're like nope gotta do my duty they, they just want to <laughs> breed them that's all they want to yeah do. it's that's it breeding breeding them breeding them yeah. um so that's uh so it's, it's it, it makes a lot of sense it's again like here i am 22 years into this this vocation didn't know that until this week yeah so it's a constant, you know, it's a constant learning, learning curve. I'm not, right, you're always you don't need to learn, you don't need to know everything to go out there and be successful, clearly. But, it, you know, uh, once you start having a little bit of success, it becomes super fun to kind of like, then when you're listening to these podcasts, you know what people are talking about and it's motiva- It's more motivation to continue learning. So what else we got on our list here? I mean, you wrote me like a freaking essay back here. Yeah, I know. And I've still, I still feel like I've rambled on. For an hour. And well, you have you have rambled, but <laughs> thanks. You're a gracious host. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've heard that before, but I wasn't being a dick to the guest either. But so I, I, I mean, you have the notes in front of you, right? Yeah, I'm looking at them. So no, you you had a couple points there talking about yeah. you know what Jesse had brought up talking about you know having a blueprint to something, and I don't know if that's something mm-hmm. you want to dive into or not. You know, uh, more so a more natural segue just for what we were just talking about. I, I, I added this one towards the bottom after we talked. So um, forgive me, you know, depending on how well versed um, your whole audience is. But um, there was I was writing um, I was writing kind of like an op ed uh, for publication in a, a pretty popular um, outdoor publication uh, out here out west. And uh, it's under consideration. One of the one of the pieces of feedback that I got I- initially is because again, I'm I'm thinking of this stuff through the lens of somebody who doesn't really know the model, doesn't know any of this at all, and so I kind of oversimplified some of the things in what I was writing. And this particular um, editorial team kind of was like, well, th- they were pointing out things that I knew, but I wasn't really saying, right? Um, about like, like I was a little bit guilty of of sort of like glorifying the role of hunters. Is, is basically the feedback that I got. And I said, you know, I can appreciate that. And and so in, in rewriting that, it got me thinking about the uh, the fact that not all state wildlife game a- agencies are created equal. And um, I think that's on full display in states, you know, like Illinois and uh, really throughout the country. So... To give, to give an example, like uh, we were talking about how little public land Illinois has uh, in comparison to some, especially states like Colorado, where I'm at right now, or Montana, uh, I think is the best. And the difference primarily is that the states, you know, a lot of states in the, the Midwest and to the East got a lot of federal land entrusted to them, and then they sold it off over, over the years. And now, you know, like 70% of the total federal lands that had been entrusted to states has been sold already to this day. And like, it's like, why would we give them more? Cause it's ours, right? It's, mm-hmm. that's like the one thing that the, if you give it to a state, because, because the, the federal government can't sell that stuff. The states can, and they have, and every time a state gets into trouble, they tend to, that's one of the things it's that tends value. to go. Yeah. They are selling your land, right? It's yours. 
You can do whatever you want with it. And, um, except in some cases on, you know, certain state land, you got to have a permit or there's certain, right, you know, it's, use it's, restrictions and that kind of stuff. With following the proper rules, it's your access, you know, land you can access. Yeah, it, you should have access to it. There might be cattle on it or whatever else, resource extraction. Uh, what I'm getting at here is that, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. It kind of ties back into what I realize is sort of the solution because, the irony here is that we have so much population, like so much of the U.S. populace is in those two-thirds of the country, like I talked about, save California, right? What do a lot of our states have in common? We don't have a ton of public land. And where are the – most of those states, where are the license sales going? Down. In most of them, right? Um, or at best staying level, but compared with like uh, per capita as percentage, still don't know. Most of those states. There's a couple here out west that have a, you know, a fair bit of public land, and depending on how they manage those resources, not just the land, but the water, the species, right? How, they, uh, how inviting or uninviting they are to out-of-state hunters. All these little things play a part, and you have a say. You just have to know what's going on. Right. So if you if you get a little bit involved, this is this is think of this as like opening the door to just a whole other world of stuff that I really not hope. I, I truly believe that a vast majority of people who, who go through, whether you use my program or not, if you just go through with the process of actually making sure that you get out in the woods this year a few times. Right. A couple times for scouting. Maybe, you know, we're, we're getting into shed season. That can be fun. That can give you some good hints on where the deer are bedding in your area and kind of tell you some things. Um, anyways, it's it's not just going out. I don't want you guys to think of this as like going out just for hunting. Like I'm going to go sit in a stand, you know, twice a day for three, four, seven days and then be done. That is not hunting, right? Hunting to me is taking part in the model, the conservation model. And you do have a say in your state. You can pressure your state representatives and you have a, a say on the federal stuff. So it's, you know, for uh, I know a lot of you, your audience is probably existing hunters to begin with. So that's why I'm talking to you guys this way, because you know that this, this stuff matters and it is at stake. And I'm telling you, we're losing the battle. So the answer, in my eyes, is getting more hunters, right? Because there's really, I looked at this problem and I went, well, I can get into politics. No. <laughs> No, you wouldn't make it very that's, far. Look at you. That you know? sounds awful. Yeah, yeah can't I know. Put you I, on I a need, stage or on a I, poster. I, I need to get myself one of those really nice blonde toupees. <laughs> right. Really comb that out. And a black um, beard that would look freaking horrible. <laughs> just real natural. <laughs> uh, you know, and then it bleach my eyebrows. Yeah. Uh, we need more hunters, and so you can either advocate for this stuff and become super involved from the, in the political process. Or you can take part in the organizations that are already doing that on our behalf. And you can show up to pint nights and you can, you can try, you know, you can get involved in whatever way matters to you. Whatever, I ask myself, what can I do? I can continue mentoring maybe one hunter a year, which needs to happen, right? This is like, a, it's like a three-tier process. We need the individual hunters to feed people. You got to feed them, feed them. Feeding them. Because if you feed if you if you're feeding them, you're breeding them. I really believe that. Like if you're <laughs> yes. feeding people, you're breeding hunters. Right? Right. So by, that's a the best recruiting Holy tool we shit. have. That is our that's that is money. If you're feeding them, you're breeding them. <laughs> um, I have my marketing cap on right now. because uh, that's truly I, I so that's the first tier. That's kind of the base, is like, yeah. Individuals just bringing people out. How do you convince them to go out there and get it themselves? You, bring, you invite them over for dinner. You don't serve them shoe leather. If you mess it up, lie to them. Go and buy a properly prepared roast and tell them it's venison. Do not feed people crappy, <laughs> dry, bland meat. Perfect your recipe, then invite people over. There's a blog, on, actually a blog article on five cardinal rules, how not to mess up your next venison meal. So... Go to, go to sportsman1.com, read the blog, then prepare really good meals, invite people over that you think might be interested in hunting. And when, and at the end, when they're complimenting you on your food, say, ask them, cool, so when am I invited over for venison dinner? Hmm? 
put it in their court. Put it on them. They yeah. say, uh, 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 do you have any interest in hunting? It's that easy to open up that conversation. They may not even need my program, but if you're willing to really put in the time, then for all their questions, refer them over to me. Now, the second tier to that is what we talked about, like QDMA with the field of fork, uh, all the um, all the stuff that BHA is doing, lowering the age of the, uh, you said the hunter ed instructors, right? Mm-hmm. Stuff like that from the NPO, from the nonprofit organization, Habitat organization side is instrumental because they're influencing policy makers. They're going, hey, man, we got a lot of these people together, right? Your 25 bucks that you gave that organization or that I gave then and QDMA and Pheasants Forever this year and every year probably for the rest of my life. That does matter because you get to show up to meetings and and, and have, a, have a say, right? They publish, the, the, they send you the, the magazines, they publish uh, like the weekly emails and stuff. You know what's going on. You have access to this stuff. And if you don't agree with some of it, you can talk to somebody. This is available to you. For the most part, I think these guys are doing a pretty darn good job. I just want to help them. Right. And then the third, of course, is like the state and federal level, and that's the policy. And uh, all these things work together to inform how, what decisions those policy those policymakers make, how they vote, You know, if a bill gets to the floor or not. And if they say they're going to do something, if somebody's not talking about this stuff at all and it's important to you, you should maybe consider – <laughs> finding another candidate yeah. or ta- or writing the guy, you know, or, or woman. The thing I'm getting at here is that, like, I thought it was all the, the, the dollars and cents, the money, the, the license and tax sales. It's only half of it. The other half is guys like you and me and our wives and, you know, uh, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, neighbors, colleagues. There's a lot more people out there that are motivated to go and, and get their food. Um, and once they do, once they've done that once and they've gone through the process and understand what it takes, they're going to start asking those questions that you and I have already started to learn to ask about food. And, and that I've, like I said, I went down the rabbit hole and now I ask it about everything, man. It's what, what did it, what did it take to get this blender to me that I'm making my smoothie in? What is it, where did this come from? Do I want to take part in this? And is there anything I can do to improve that process to make it more healthy for me and more sustainable for the world that we live in? Because it's 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 not that it, society doesn't exist in, in spite of, of what Billy and I are talking about, you and I are talking about here. It, we very much rely on all those natural resources. And if we if we lose enough of them, the scales are going to tip and we're going to become Europe, where it's like people say, like, hunting is a rich man's sport. Well, yeah, in most other countries it is. Mm-hmm. So... In this case, it very much, I truly believe it is a use it or lose it situation. Yeah. And it's getting that, it's getting that conversation out there because there's a large majority of, of people. I mean, I can even think of my immediate family at, you know, I have family members that are just totally just unaware of what the big picture is. And I don't think that they, if they knew they would be bothered by it, but they don't have any idea because they're not plugged in. So it's a matter of, you know, being part of that conversation, having that conversation at different levels when appropriate, you know, you don't need to be coming into deer camp and saying, Oh my God, we're about to, you know, hunting's almost over and we're going to lose mm-hmm. everything. Like that's, I don't think, you know, fear mongering is not what we're trying to do here. It's just, you got to look at the big picture. And if you aren't aware of some of these challenges, John and I aren't, you know, here with all the doctrines of all the information of all this stuff. And there's a lot of really good podcasts and publications and stuff like that out there that are talking about the details of these things but you know you have to be looking at that and we keep hearing over and over about hunter numbers going down and it all goes back to doing each and every one of our parts to try to help bring someone in around us and i talked on one of the last one of our more recent podcasts and it might have been on the the reboot about just influencing the sphere around you you know every one of us has the ability with our phones and our social media you know, think about what you're posting, you know, show the, show the goods of it. Don't hide the bads of it. But, you know, if you're going to put your stuff out there, you need to be thinking about how you're presenting it. And you don't want to turn that one person off because then that one person can turn their entire sphere off, you know? So it's, we're, it's a very interesting world we're living in now where everything that we do is on display, Uh right, wrong, or indifferent. And, you can use that as an extreme tool here to broaden 
your reach and try to bring more people into what we're doing, you know, by sharing the, yeah. the fun side of it. Allow me to make, you know, one more plea to the hunters listening to this for your podcast too. Um, that makes a really good point, man. The, um, the media side is everything. And, you know, I, I talked a little bit about, um, on the, the tomorrow's hunter podcast, how like, uh, mainstream media tends to report, you know, two to three X more negative news. Cause that's what responds. That's what gets the highest response rate. And, you know, uh, they're they're not um, they're no different from any other uh, station or a program. They have to have decent ratings, otherwise they get cut. Right. So it's like okay, we show people what they're going to engage with, um, and then social media is kind of like the other side. Well, we've made it worse because we're all plugging our data into these machines that are always constantly trying to market to us, and so we get our news in the same place as. Uh, and I'm, I'm putting news in a very loose term, yeah. but a lot of people now are consuming what they would consider news through the same medium as how they talk to their friends and accept marketing and advertisements, right? And that is all an amalgam. You're all we're, we're all creating this little like information ball that's just getting more and more robust, and it's just growing into this like you know this like tentacled ugly disgusting monster yeah um and it's kind of hard to undo now think about that that's the way you see the world that's the way this this kind of like invisible machine thinks that you want to see the world it's not right by the way it's almost never right um but like it's weird how you're like hmm, i was just talking about my back hurting and now i see these like massage things <laughs> right. Consi- right like you're like yeah. i didn't even put that into instagram or google but that so like advertisers are all trying to figure out what you want to see and what you're into. Politicians are doing the same thing. It's election season. News and media and all that stuff. And these platforms are, are filtering funneling all that stuff through. Now consider what you're putting out there and who is who is going to see it. That is a really, really important consideration to make. You are, whether you like it or not, if you're taking part in the digital sphere, you are an ambassador for hunting. Right. Think twice about what you put out there. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know the, that the big topic of like grip and grins, that's been out there for a couple of years now. And I personally have no issue with the grip and grin, but be conscious of what that grip and grin looks like. Yeah. You know, put the tongue in the mouth. You know, if, if you shot the deer in the neck to finish it, you know, flip the deer over and make sure that that hole isn't right there in front of people. Because if you're, if you're somebody who's never hunted before and you don't understand that, to me or you, it's like, well, that's where he had to, that's where he shot it or that's where the finish was or whatever. But yeah. to somebody that's not in that world, my God, does that turn you off? You know? And, and it's like, oh, you know what? That's disgusting. I'm just going to go to the supermarket and buy my steak. You know, that's, and can we, can we also, even though that cow most likely died like a worse death. I mean, you know, his, the last couple of days of, of his nobody life. Nobody saw it. So it's. Right. So it's like, it, again, it you could turn this off. Where did it come from? consider that right where did it come from so i'm not here's here's the other side to that is that like a lot of companies are not doing us like the industry a favor at all you know uh because they're they're kind of like i'm not going to name companies but there's a particular firearm company i can think of that's basically like it's just really really divisive content um they'll put they'll put stuff out that's specific i mean you know who they're going after right and it's almost like it's almost like they want you know, somebody carrying one of their sidearms to be a badge of honor for that particular crowd. And it's like, you know, F your feelings. And like, you know, it's like, jeez, yeah. dude. That's pretty like, aggressive, I, yeah. Yeah, it's just, well, it's it's not really called for. And by the way, like, okay, I mean, if that's working for you, but I truly believe that you're shooting yourself in the proverbial foot by doing that. I, I cannot align with you because the folks that you're you're appealing to first off, are only a, a small subsection of the people who already take part in this culture. The, mm-hmm. We'll call it like the greater hunting culture, but it's like, it's more than that. Yeah. Most of the, the market is not that. Right. They're not there. Yeah, so and, you're, yeah. you're, you're purposely choosing to close yourself off to growth, to capitalize on a smaller subsection of an existing and shrinking, ever-shrinking market. More, there are fewer of these people that exist annually. Yeah. Right. We're aging out. We're dying. We're uh, whatever. And so you know that's <laughs> it's funny. Uh, 
I, I thought about this too because I bought a, a hat that just says "Eat Venison." I don't know if you saw that guy on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. You told hat. me about him, so I follow him. So now. simple. Yeah, yeah. I, I bought a beanie. I love it. Um, I bought that hat. I was like, "Simple message is amazing." And I thought in my head, I'm like, "Man, I could have had a whole lot of hats and T-shirts for like, you know, the several thousand dollars in two years that I put into this." <laughs> right. And I thought, I'm like, man, I'm probably like, you know, if you and if you think of all the, I mean, it has to be in the thousands of hours that I put into this program and building it and marketing it and all that now. I'm like, probably would have been easier to just sell a shirt, you know, but would I have been changing anything? Right. No. I mean, it's, you know, nothing wrong with that. I bought it. I like the product, but like there are products that are way more guilty of that. If I had just, you know, so I have this, this bow hunter die t-shirt. If I had just printed, if I just screen printed, you know, a couple hundred t-shirts that just said, kill vegans like I, I probably would have been more profitable than i am right now yeah. but i i would have been hurting the cause yeah you know and that's that's where i'm at right now i was like it new hunt, hunters are easy to find you know we're, we're actually pretty easy to access because we have so many similar kind of threads we're, we're easy to just like again put into that little marketing tool and just get stuff in front of us hunters that are uh, aspiring hunters people who are considering this i'm finding that more difficult <laughs> so if we got any marketing gurus out there sure would have. uh don't but look that's, at that's me what I, we're doing right now yeah that's I, I i thought to myself like is there you know because there's i i don't trust sorry i don't trust like the state any state or federal government to solve this problem that's not where marketers go that's not where good marketers go mm-hmm. for careers right um i, I trust the private sector to kind of solve this problem in tandem and kind of lead the way for those, those state and federal agencies and work in tandem with them and the NPOs, like the ones we talked about, and so, so many more to influence the policy rising tide, man, right. Raise nice. all the ships. But it, I feel, I really do feel like, you know, it's, it's going to be up to, to folks like us be like using ingenuity and kind of figuring out how to crack this code and then share it with, with the rest of the organizations how we reach enough of these, you know, quote unquote, aspiring hunters or, I don't know, people who are contemplating hunting efficiently and effectively and quickly enough so that we can get ahead of this thing. Yep. Hey, it all starts with the conversation. It starts with doing something and you've done it by putting together your program and I'm sure you'll continue to, to work with that and develop it and tweak it as times change and more information is available, whatever. It's, it's probably a living and breathing document and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, more power to you for, for taking the hard road and actually trying to do something that will have a long lasting legacy and effect on, on hunting and our passion instead of going the easy route and making a t-shirt and making a, making some money to, you know, pay your rent and, uh, and go that route. So, you know, I appreciate what you're doing with this and I, you know, right. You're pretty, you know, that you're kind of getting this thing off the ground right now. And, uh, you know, I'm very excited to see what transpires for you. And I think, uh, I think you'll do very well with it from the, what I've seen, you know, you've put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into it and it's a passion project and, uh, people like you that do that end up figuring out a way to make it work and get it out in front of the right people. So it's good stuff, man. And it's too late to turn back now. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on the show and thanks for what you do, man. I mean, you know, I've seen this stuff. I followed you guys now for a little over a month on Instagram. I see that you guys are putting boots on the ground and actually, you know, putting your, your so-called money where your mouth is. Um, all that stuff does make a difference. So, you know, keep leading by example. I appreciate and, that. And uh, for any, yeah, for anybody who, who is interested in the program, if you have somebody in your lives, um, I came up with an idea this week that I, I want to test out. So, if you're okay with uh, with me giving your your audience sort of a like a promo code, yeah, I, I have kind of an interesting concept here. So uh, follow me for a second. Um, so I came up with the idea of hashtag hunting buddy, right? Because one isn't enough. So if you're if you have somebody in your life who is considering getting into hunting, um, you know, and and maybe you're 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 worried that you're not going to do them the most justice because we're all busy, man. I get it. Like our time in the woods is limited. And I do feel like I, I give up quite a bit of it to people who don't always wind up buying the, the tag and the license the next year. So I can appreciate that. So here, here's my, uh, here's my appeal. 
Hashtag Hunting Buddy is, is a program that we're going to be promoting uh, over the course of the next several months, all the way going into hunting season. And the idea is very simple. If you're an existing hunter, what I want you guys to do is if you have a conversation with somebody or, you know, they listen to this podcast and they're motivated to get into the, the Whitetail 101 program or just hunting in general, take a photo, tag at Whitetail 101 underscore, Whitetail underscore 101 on Instagram or tag us on Facebook, uh, hashtag it hunting buddy and uh just send us like your names you know where you're from and your respective experience put as much or as little information as you want in the post and just tag us we'll dm you with a, a discount code for 20 percent off if uh if now here's here's the catch so if if more than one person does this so hunting buddy like we'll send you the code it'll be unique if one person uses it it's 20 percent off if two people use it, it's 30% off. Three people use it, it's 40% off. And so we're motivating. It's going to get easier and easier to get the next person and the next person to get on because we need a lot of people now. We need like 100,000 hunters like five years ago. So, um, I, Bill, I hope you, you got all that. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'll ask Billy to put that in the show notes. But it's hashtag hunting buddy. Um, so, you know, follow us. I'll, I'll be posting um, on Instagram and Facebook periodically every couple of weeks to remind people about that hunting buddy promotion. Um, but if you've just got one person in your life, they get 20% off the program. So it goes from like 50 bucks down to 40. And then as we go, th go through, if you get more and more, um, e each time, just set tag another person. And each time you tag them say, Hey, you know, remind us we, we already tagged one. And the next guy or girl gets 30, the next guy gets 40. We'll awesome. go all the way up to 99% off. You can get 10 other people out in the woods. We're giving the program away. Because the goal is gonna, to get and, new hunters out and there. And that, so if you're the 10th person, you're getting it for 99% off. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And you get it for less than a dollar. That's awesome. That's cool. cool. That's awesome. So that's man. the deal. Now, not 10 people total. We're talking like you got it. So you or the person that you. Well, follow, yeah, follow the bouncing ball. So it's yeah, going to so get all the way so, out. So send us a new photo. Right with, with with the new hunter, hashtag it, uh, tag us, and then uh, and we'll DM you with the with a code for for an increasing amount of percent off. Because like I said, I mean I'm putting my money where my mouth is now. Two years here, and I, if if you get ten people in, I'm saying I'm pat on the back, take it for basically for free. Go have fun this year. Send us some photos. That's awesome. Good stuff, man. Keep up the good work. Feed Thanks, them uh, means you're breeding them. <laughs> feed, yep, you got to feed them to breed them, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the key to my my heart was always my stomach, so hey. it makes sense that it would work for other people. That's it, buddy. All right, thanks a lot, John. I appreciate your time. We'll we'll talk thanks. soon, I'm sure. Yeah, go sell some buses. I'll go drive mine. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> See you, Cheers. buddy. Bye.